Before we kick off, actually, um, first of all, if you've got questions, there is a Q&A session at the end. But I like people to ask questions as you go along, okay? Because if it's relevant, it's always good to, to ask that question straight away. So feel free to, to, to ask questions as we go along. And I want to try and to get it a little bit more um, interactive. I don't want me to stand up here for 50 minutes just talking because even I will get bored of myself by then. Okay, introduction, the bumpy road to Agile. Right, so basically, um, this is my own personal experiences over the last 20 plus years of trying to implement Agile, mainly scaled Agile is what we're talking about tonight. I'm not gonna come up with some magic wand and this is a perfect way to do it. I'm just gonna explain some of the pitfalls and some of the issues you need to look at that I personally came across as I say, if you guys have got something similar, shout out. If you think I'm missing something, great, fire away. If you've got a magic wand, then please join Brenda. We need those people, okay? Um, why listen to me? I've been in software development for about 35 plus years. I'm not going to say exactly how many over 35, but it's getting bigger. Um, I've started life as a software developer. I've been working on agile patterns um, before the the turn of the millennium um, so you know I've got quite a bit of experience of this I have managed to get it wrong and quite a few times um, you know I've got reasonably good results but I've hit some big problems and with hindsight there's a lot of things I would do differently if I went back to what I was doing 10 15 20 years ago I'm also um, a software development a head of software development so I've implemented agile from inside an organization as the head of development, typically, um, rather than going in as a consultant. Okay, right, so first of all, I had trouble ha thinking how I was gonna um, collect everything in this talk and organize it. So I've gone back to, basically, this is my fall back on any presentation, okay? So the why, what, where, when, who, how, the very vaguely collect collections under these, okay? But that's just how I'm um, grouping everything. So, starting off, why? First question you should always ask yourself is why are you going to do something? And these are some of the honest reasons I have been asked to implement Scale Agile. Yes, a CEO has come back from golfing with the boys and told me, John, you need to scale Agile because this is apparently going to be fantastic. Okay. Or they've just gone off that flight where they've been on the business trip and they've read the business magazine. At least they've got a little bit more facts there, but not so good. I've actually been hired on more than one occasion to go into an organization where they've had a perceived failing development team. I don't say it was a failing development team. They were actually producing some wonderful software, just not at the pace that uh, the senior management wanted. Um, so I've gone in there and looked at their processes and been brought in to actually do exactly scaled agile. Um, you know, I've actually had slightly better views where the CEOs come down and said, John, you need to do more for less. Now bugger off and sort it. And literally that has been about the, 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 uh, the level of detail some of the guys have gone in. So you can have lots of reasons why. Not typically the ones that you, you really want. Okay, I have never had a CEO come to me and say, John, we need to focus more on delivering value. We need to start looking at our decision-making process and make it quicker. You know, we need to have more effective communication across the whole organization and not just with the delivery team. You know, let's streamline operations and make things lean. These are conversations I've not had, unfortunately. Love to. And, you know, if you can get your CEOs and senior leadership team to start having these conversations, brilliant. But they're not the kind of things, unfortunately, over the years I've had. So, why have I personally implemented Agile? Honest, the reasons on the other screen are the reasons I think Agile works, the scaled Agile works. Um, and it is a good solution for some organisations. It's not going to fit all organisations. We'll come to that a little bit later. Typically, I've gone in as a, I say, head of development, development manager, and they've had multiple development teams. And basically, they need to work together better. If you've got teams that are completely separate, doing their own thing, fine. But if you're trying to get teams to work closer and better, 
then having some framework to help you do that is brilliant. If you're working on complex projects and they're covering multiple teams and they're potentially in lots of different locations, then that's where Scaled Agile and the frameworks have a lot of value. And rather than reinventing the wheel yourself, let's see what you can use and borrow from, from those frameworks. Um, I then need to engage with the greater business. I'm a, an old programmer, I'm great, put me in a dark room, give me you know, a spec and I'll write some code. Not really where we are anymore in the world. We need to engage, we need to make sure that we're right, developing the right software and giving the right value. To do that, you need to engage with the whole business. It is remarkable how many organizations won't actually engage with the development. They'll give them some requirement and then six months, nine months, a year later, they say, okay, well, where is it? And that's their idea of engagement. Agile frameworks rely heavily and will impose better communications on the organization. So really cool if you can actually get it. But the red bit is very key here. It's all about setting realistic expectations. As you say, if you've been told that what I want out of our child is for you to do a lot more John with less. Well, no, and definitely not no from day one. Sometime in the future, when you've got Agile working brilliantly, you've got lots of automated processes, you're only delivering value to the business, then you're going to be delivering more value, maybe less software, but definitely more value to the business. So yes, there are things you can do there, but you know, if the guy's sitting there thinking next year I can half the development budget, it's not going to happen. Okay, uh, in that case, I'd advise you to get looking for jobs um, and join a wonderful consultancy if you can. Um, so it's very important that all your stakeholders, I mean, I've mentioned CEOs and CTOs in there, but all the stakeholders have realistic expectations about what you're going to do. It's the same with any project or program. Okay. So is Scale Agile just another software development life cycle? You know, or is it a fad? You know. A lot of people think it's just a fad, there's lots of buzzwords, you know, let's talk scrum, let's talk tribes and squads and, and whatever. Okay. It's a lot bigger than software develop, development life cycle. You can implement your own software development life cycle within the delivery team. You don't need to engage the rest of the world to do that. It's good to have the support guys involved if you are doing the software development life cycle process. And obviously, you know, it depends where the testing team and where the the um, product management are, but fundamentally that's within your remit to control. It's a lot bigger than that, okay? The other thing is Scaled Agile ain't just lots of little scrum teams. Scrum is designed to, for um, small squads, small teams of developers. And when I say developer, I mean tester, software developer, you know, requirements gathering, BA, whatever you put in those squads. Um, to deliver value. Scaled Agile is when you've got lots of teams that need to work together to deliver value. And it's that working together is, a, is quite a key bit. By the way, the way we're going at the moment, we will beat the 50 minute mark, so don't worry, because <laughs> I know you, you haven't got drinks right now. Okay, so give you an idea of when did the idea of Scaled Agile appear? Well, I first started using it in, I think it was 1997, in a software house in London, where we were using DSDM. That's still around, it's still valid today. It is a very heavy, sort of, I like to call it like the Prince 2 of the Agile world, okay? But it's a valid framework. It's got time boxing, it's got Moscow, it's got these wonderful things that you would expect. I'd say that was around the 90s. Now, on what well, I haven't got on this slide, is there was actually a methodology called Crystal, which was sort of scaled agile in the 80s, right? So, you know, we are talking about nothing new here. You know, you had the um, Agile Manifesto in 2001. Scrum's been around since 2001. Therefore, Nextus and things like that, which is a, the um, scaled agile version of Scrum, have been around for 21 years now. They've been around, they've They've evolved, they've improved. So you're not talking about a fad. If it was a fad, it would have gone by now. Okay. And um, there's lots of other key uh, dates on that. I mean, the less, which is um, 
large scale Scrum, you've got Safer, this is the Scale Agile Framework. They've been around for a long time. Okay, so Evolve, I think Safe is on version 5 right now, for instance. So they're around, they're mature models. Okay, so you can get around anyone's trying to say it's a fad. Lots of different frameworks and they suit different businesses. Okay, I'm not going to tell you which framework to go for, although this one is brilliant. Okay, um, but seriously, they do different things. I started off using Nexus. Um, I had three or four teams that were working in loosely coupled projects, and it's easier because it's an extension of Scrum. Some of the models, such as um, you know, scaled to Scrum, and well, actually, mainly um, things like Safe, are very detailed. If you want a big organization and you want to get true agile across an organization, not just a delivery team, then frameworks like Safe are fantastic for that. But there's a lot more to them and there's a lot harder to implement. And everything else in between. Okay. Obviously bad, it's blended. The idea of that is that you can actually chop and change and use the bits that really do help your organization and not the bits that don't. Makes perfect sense. So, which model to choose? Some questions you need to ask yourself. Don't do what I did the first time I did a, a scaled agile was, I've got this model, now try and get the company to fit it. Okay, that's a, not an ideal way to do it. Um, it turned out actually it was a reasonably good model for what I was trying to do, but that was more luck than judgment. So, ask yourself some questions, you know, do you have a single squad working on a single product? If great, sit back relax you never need to do scaled agile you know you're happy dead easy to manage one scrum team if you've got multiple squads working on separate products for instance you could be a consultancy where you've got one squad working on one client site one squad working. then again it's a lot easier to manage that you don't there isn't that need to tightly work together and um, yes you still want some governance you still want to be able to see what all the projects are doing and there are some advantages of implementing Agile, um, but you wouldn't need a complex model like SAFE. Now, the real agile benefits of Scale Agile is when you start coming down to the, either you've got a couple teams, and if you've got lots of modern technology, you know, you've got your microservices, that's great, and all your teams are functional, they're not actually based on tiers of the product, then great, you know, you're in a nice place and you'll get scaled agile to work well the real world is where you've got tightly coupled products and um, you've got squads that may be doing the ui you might have a database squad you might have the, a, a few guys working on a mainframe that's part of the key part of the solution lots of different technology lots of combined squads all having to work together that is where you get a massive benefit from scaled agile it's also by far the hardest to implement and you can throw into that, I mean, I've had features where I've had guys working on hardware products, the firmware, and then the actual software application that it runs with. Software application, dead easy to do scale agile with. Hardware, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you need to realize that, okay, bits of it aren't going to be agile. Okay, so, yeah, far away. I'll come on to that. It's a very good question. Keep that. But what are the key things? And I'll hopefully come on to some of those later on. That's a very good question. And we could probably make the whole slide presentation a lot shorter if I just answer that now. <laughs> I'm trying to in my keep. Um, but if I haven't answered it by the to the Q&A stage, A, I apologise. We should have. But if I haven't, do ask me that question again. That's a lovely question. So you need to pick your framework. To pick your framework, you need to know the frameworks and you need to know your business. Um, obviously, if you don't know your frameworks, you're not going to sit there reading them all in detail, going on all the training to decide which one. But you can very quickly gauge that some are very complex and heavyweight and some are lighter. And it depends on your, your company, what you can do with those. OK, so where to implement Scrum? This is a bit of a, a dodgy one with the where, but it fits in with the, the rest of the W's. Um, okay, so do you have multiple delivery departments? Now, 
I've worked with quite a few organizations that have a delivery team in Spain, a delivery team in, say, Sweden. Um, they are running different departments. They can be complete separate entities. Um, and that can make an interesting challenge. You may have develop developers in the UK and testing teams in offshore, say, India. Uh, again, that adds an extra dynamic to it. And how do you manage those dynamics? So you need to start looking at the problems that you think you're going to have to make sure you, you pick a framework that's got a chance to solve them. Um, you know, local and remote. Agile works great if everyone's in the room together. Um, I don't know anyone who's had that luxury over the last two or three years for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, so we're all used to working remotely and better at working remotely now. And funny enough, that has made the offshore onshore bit a bit less of an issue. It's dead easy to work with colleagues offshore now because you, everyone's remote and everyone's dialing in. You don't get that problem that the team's all sat in having the daily scrum around a, a board and a camera and the poor guys who are offshore can't get a word in edgeways because I'm talking. Um, so, you know, it, it has improved a lot of things. Um, if you've got lots of teams, and I know this looks a bit of a strange one, do they know who you are? You know, I'm running the development in, in, in the UK. They don't know me. In, in say Sweden, um, I don't know why I'm picking on Sweden, but there you go. So, do they know who you are? Would they respect what I'm saying? Would they trust me? The answer probably is no, because they don't know who you are. You're English. You've probably got your own agenda. So you need to think about things and how you break down those barriers, etc. So you must also understand your your limitations. I can't influence. <laughs> I'll pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> that was an oops, in case anyone didn't hear. Um, it wouldn't have been picked up in the mic. Um, <coughs> you need to understand your limitations, right? Um, you go in a, you want to install Agile, brilliant scale Agile, it's going to be fantastic. But if you don't influence the people in Sweden, then it ain't going to happen there. So you need to know that and be honest with yourself. What can you do? What can't you do? Um, and, you know, the CEO saying, right, Sweden, you're going to do what John says, doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. So be honest with yourself about what you can and cannot work on. OK. And again, you know, you don't need to do Big Bang. Right. If you've got divisions and areas, you could try Agile. And depending especially what model it is, you can do um, or framework. Sorry, I should be calling them. You can do it um, a little bit more piecemeal. But you can't get, here's the department of 10 teams. I'll do scaled agile with one team. Well, obviously, that ain't going to work. You need at least three. But if you have three working scaled agile, it's not going to work for the others. It's very difficult to sort of do that creeping sort of barrage approach to implementing it. So you need to, to think about that. Well, that's what I've found anyway. Okay. Um, picking the right time. Now, this sounds a bit silly. But what is the right time? If you're right in the middle of the most important project your company has ever got to deliver, it's probably not the time to change your ways of working. Okay, So you've got to think about that. You've got to think, if I'm suddenly pulling people off the project to start implementing and helping me de uh, deliver a new framework, they're not going to be happy if it causes impact to their super project. The other flip side of that, and this is a problem, everything's about a bit of balance. The flip side of that is that you're always busy. I've never met anyone in IT in 35 years who wasn't overworked and over busy. So you can always find excuses for not starting a project or a program. Now, if you're talking about a big transformation program, you're talking about typically 18 months or something is a, is a kind of time frame you, you, you're looking at. Um, smaller squads, some of the simpler models quicker, you know, some of the more complex ones across the whole organization could take longer. So, yeah, you're going to hit holiday periods. Totally agree with that. You're going to hit, hit deadlines, but at least start your program where, you know, say in September, where you've got a nice run and an, op an opportunity to do some work. Unless you're working on the VAX jabbing 
project, which has kicked off in September and really caused me problems with my presentation, but that's a different issue. So pick your time well, okay? And that's what I mean about time. It's not magic, it's nothing special, but do think about it. If you start in summer when no one's around, you're not going to get any momentum or traction. And without that, you don't want something starting as flat, because it, it just will continue that way. Who? This is here just to add some colour. Okay. <laughs> but but a bit like the various and the 13 of them. I know there's now 14 doctors. I couldn't find a slide with the 14th guy on. Um, but just like the doctors, they're all similar. You know, they're running around the universe, saving mankind because they're lovely people, but they're all different. And companies and organisations are like that. So I split the who into two bits. I'm going to talk about organisation and then I want to talk about people. So first of all, a bit of interaction. Who has a project management office in their organization? Hands up. So a few. Project management officers are not the enemy, right? They're not part of Agile. They're all about project management and governance. And you think, oh God, they're all going to cause us problems. You're not going to get rid of the PMO. If you've got one in your organization, you're not going to come along and say, we're going to implement Agile, bye bye PMO. Senior management love it. And they love it for a reason. That's where they get a lot of their information from. So what you've got to do is, is work with these. I mean, they're perceived as being, you know, obsessed with dates and KPIs. When you start talking to them, that's only because that's what senior management are asking them for. They're nice <laughs> people, they know what they're doing. They're experienced people, okay? So don't see them as the enemy and, and they're, they're stopping Agile. They're not. They're trying to make sure senior management have the right information. Um, so, you know, use them and see what we can use them for. Um, you need them on your side. And I'm going to say that about a lot of teams. As a matter of fact, I don't know a single part of the company you don't need on your side. So I'll repeat that quite a few times. You need the PMO on your side they are automatically going to be nervous and scared of Agile because Agile has this image that they don't need project managers, they don't need control, it's all about chaos, it's all terrible Okay, to them. That's the view that they've been told. Um, and so you need to, like everyone, work on that and see, make sure they have a role and they will have a role in your organisation even after you've implemented Scrum Agile. Uh, scaled agile okay and again project managers seen as a curse of, of, of um, agile they're not the wonderful people they have a, a, a need and a use um, so get them rte for anyone who uh, doesn't know is a release train engineer now how many people if you hadn't done safe would know what the hell a release train engineer is. God, why have they called it that? Don't know. There is a view, some people try, organization try and say, right, I've got these project managers, we'll cover, talk about them in a minute. Um, so let's just give them agile roles. It is very different, I'll go into that in a minute. Some people can make the move, some people won't. But don't automatically say PMs or just make them release train engineers if you were going down safe and there are, other roles um, in other models. So, how do you work with a PMO? Um, I'd say it doesn't mean chaos. You will need governance and reporting. All organizations need governance and reporting, especially if you've got people funding you, backing you. Um, organizations run off plans. You can't turn around to your customer base and say, we're going to deliver this super new product sometime next year. We'll let you know when we get there and don't buy our competitors because, you know, we're going to get there sometime. It doesn't work. You need to be able to give them hard dates. So, you know, having an organization, a, a, a team of people who help you with that planning and help you get those dates is, is quite useful. I tend to use the PMO and project managers as like an umbrella sitting over the top of the Agile process. And, you know, if you're using things like release cycles, you can say, well, this release will have this content and we're going to release it on this date. And you can guarantee the date. Um, in an ideal world, you can say, well, here's the must-haves, we can guarantee those and here's the should-haves. 
The problem with that model is I've yet to find an organisation in 35 years that has should-haves. I've been trying, I've been looking, every stone I can find, I'll look under them, and that is a problem. problem. With some of the Agile concepts, they're great on paper, but in a real organisation, they're very difficult to actually implement. But you can do them. Um, also, you know, if you've got a mix of internal and external providers, you can't go to an external provider unless you're working exceptionally close with them and say, we want to have your daily stand-ups, we want to be in there, we want you to, to follow our scrum pattern and our candence. doesn't happen. So all of a sudden, you've start and got parts of your agile delivery project that are more traditional, more waterfall. And if you start looking at waterfall bits of your projects, you need to have PMs to manage those bits. Because in that child portfolio, you haven't got anything. So you do need PMs and they add value. There are lots of uh, situations. If you've got, you know, um, strategic, you know, hard deadlines, legal governance and targets you have to hit, having a PM chasing your teams up and managing that is a useful thing to have. So PMs, bring them aboard. You probably don't need as many as you've got today, but you will need them and try to get them encouraged. Okay. Quality assurance teams. And I said quality assurance rather than testing here. So again, who has quality assurance, a separate quality assurance function in their organization? Okay, lots do. I'm currently working on an NHS project at the moment. They've got clerical quality assurance, clerical assurance, clinical, sorry, assurance. No way are you going to replace that. It has to be there. You, they have to make sure that the software you are providing is clinically safe. End of story. So you can have a wonderful agile model, but there are going to be teams in there that cause a problem. With the traditional sort of QA, gone in there, looked at it, said, I'm implementing Agile, I have disbanded the team, put them into the, the squads, typically made the, the um, manager into um, either a scrum master or um, actually quite often a product owner. Because funny enough, QA departments have so much knowledge of the product, it's frightening. Sometimes more than sort of the product owners and the BAs. So I have found that the senior testers actually quite often make really good product owners because they know the products and know the people. Um, you know, you can create a, um, uh, a chapter or whatever term you want, or a best practice um, group, and they can share that to make sure that everyone's still got testing good governance and stuff. But typically I break that department down. But as I say, there are roles in organizations where you can't do that and you need them. Um, if you have got a lot of third party products, someone's got to test those third party elements and deliveries, and then you need to test it more as a system level. So you're still talking, still having system testing. You might still have customer testing. You might need people to work with customers to do their user acceptance testing. Again, it's not typically a squad. So you might end up still having that feature uh, and that function. You just need to make sure what their role is. <laughs> they also do wonderful things like performance testing, scalability testing. They might do um, accessibility testing. Um, lots of things that you might not have enough experts to fit in each squad, or there might not be enough work for someone in the squad to be doing that. So again, you need to look at your structure, look at what you're trying to deliver, and and be flexible you know don't follow a pattern if that particular scaled agile model is going to break your business then you know be sensible with it okay um so mentioned it covers both um so how do you work with the qa guys uh again very much on the model you're looking at um i've mentioned the chapter best practice the other thing you need to be aware of is if you've got a mixture of waterfall and agile projects and most organizations still do i mentioned you know i've worked with a company that we did lots of software i was responsible for um the equivalent of a call center hub software 
but we had hardware and firmware coming into that call center <coughs> um, and basically that didn't work in an agile you cannot actually manufacture design hardware in a, in a particular agile way um, so we had a separate testing team we had testers within the squads for testing the software but we had a separate team for bringing it all together and doing some of the that, that testing and it's all about engaging these people and talking to them and making them feel valued and understanding that when you bring agile in they're not losing their role they're not losing the responsibility if anything they can end up with more responsibility um, don't overplay that bit because they want more money um, but it's all about making people feel safe as part of this agile implementation product management not product owners right product management most organizations should have product <coughs> managers uh, product manager is all about looking at the distance where do we want to go what are the opportunities for my organization and what do I need to fulfill to get you know to, to, to meet those obligations talking with customers not what's your problem today but what do you think your problem is going to be next year and the year after that is quite a key role product management is not product owners product owners know the detail and the now um, and a lot of scaled agile frameworks do actually have product management and product owners but you need product management to allow the product owners to do their job and that's always the problem the biggest bug that I've had in every organization I've done you know down to just implementing scrum all the way up to trying to do scaled agile is actually getting product owners who are allowed to do their job um, because you get senior management directors everyone saying oh no 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 this is what I need to do this is what needs to be in the product well the product owner needs to be able to say as long as I meet the high level strategy that the product management team and the roadmap the management team are producing I have responsibility and I'm accountable for my product it is a very difficult problem to solve and anyone here who's got a good idea of how to help me do that please let me know I try to do it with the communication but especially for instance if you're working in a small company where the MD founded it it's their baby that is exceptionally difficult getting that individual to let go and have someone else make decisions even if it is just what color a button should be or something it's frightening very difficult you need to explain to them the easiest way around it it's okay you know you can do it now with one or two or three squads what are you going to do when there are 10 squads and you're paying people to sit there and do nothing because you haven't made a decision yet and that sometimes helps depends on the person's ego I have had people turn around saying not a problem <laughs> I can manage it okay so product owner is different from product management product management is very key and a lot of the frameworks it is a key role within that framework but as you see a product manager is not in the normal delivery fold so you are talking about impacting areas outside of the delivery team and that is a key message about scaled agile it ain't a delivery problem it's an organizational problem okay about half an hour in is that right I think um, so I say product management I think we've covered most of this um, now this is where it gets a bit funny a product manager can also be a product owner and I've seen that a few times um, that's a strange one it does work if it's a small organization um, you do find in that case the product owner does tend to allow the product the product manager does tend to allow the product owner to do stuff um, but it doesn't scale so obviously when you start looking up at scaling you have problems okay um, and the key thing um, little message at the bottom is it, it, it is quite important the product management team should be focusing on the company's vision and its mission statement and its objectives right it's high level stuff 
you know, let the product owners worry about how you actually implement that change. So product management's strategic, product owners tactical. Right, strange one, uh, the sales team. Now, sales team have a lot of influence in a lot of organizations, okay? They make the money. The sales director, therefore, has a lot of influence in an organization. You need to get him on your side. The sales director will see you coming along saying, we're going to break the model. We're going to do all these changes. Things are going to slow down whilst we do them, guys. He's not going to be overly impressed. Also, salespeople, by their nature, are looking at their current targets. They'll have targets to hit quarterly, definitely annually, but probably quarterly. If you turn around and say, yeah, we're going to give you something great in a year's time, but your next set of targets are all going to get missed, um, they're not going to back you. And if you don't have that sales guy backing you, he's going to be complaining constantly at the CEO and the senior leadership team, right? So you need to understand the salesman's problems you should know them anyway as a delivery uh, manager, delivery lead, because you're trying to actually meet their problems. Um, understand the problems, understand the pain, and then you need to have some frank conversations. And, you know, you've got this lowly little person coming up the C CTO and saying, look, you know, you've got these sales targets. We need to implement Scaled Agile. You're not going to hit those sales targets. And that's not a message they're going to like. You've got to be very careful how you say it. Um, but, you know, if you want the sales team on, on board and you don't want them being negative and trying to knock it, you need to try and see if those conversations can happen. And it's about being honest and it's about having trust. And it depends on your organization's culture. There are organizations I would not go to the CTO and say, the CEO and say, we're going to, this project's going to implement your targets. Can there I are others. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. For me, come up with assumptions that you would make, you would assume as an organisation you decided to implement scale agile. So you would assume you have buy in top, bottom, back and forth. I'm not saying 100%, but when you're talking about you know, key, key decision makers, everyone influence them, and you would, you would really hope they were already on board with what you're trying to achieve. Because if not, okay. how you need to implement agile, let alone scale agile, is almost impossible. Okay, I think um, you're very fortunate. I have never been in an organization where I've gone in and had um, the whole organization in the bought into the vision of what Scaled Agile can give you to begin with. Hence some of the problems I've had. Now, I think it, it's still a very difficult thing to do if you have got that buy-in, but I have had that problem. I've had, as I say, a CTO or CEO or someone senior has said, this is a great idea. Or, you know, I've gone in and saying, these guys are broken, we need to get them to work better. And you've looked and say, what pattern can I use? How can I get those teams to work better and closer together? Then you need to go, before you actually start doing things, try to get that buy-in. It is, if you're good at selling yourself, if you're good at selling it, you can, and it depends on the culture of the organization. There are organizations out there that will never implement a scaled agile until they have a major cultural change. Now, part of scaled agile should help you with the cultural change, you know, as part of doing that implementation. But if you're in an organization and everyone says and realizes we have a problem or we have an opportunity and this scaled agile, if we do it right, will get it implemented, you have you half the battle won. And that is a fantastic position to be in. I've been in organisations that want it, but aren't in the state to deliver it. Uh, Sorry, I yeah. As well, you know, I've found other places as well where the entire management team, top down, fully bought into it, but they haven't realised implications. So they only go on board, yeah. they're going to be safe about it, and they're like, oh, and, you've got that your hands. And the thing is, um, you can be, if you're not careful, uh, and possibly one of my own weaknesses is I'm too honest and truthful. I do try to put a little bit of spin on stuff. I'm not naive, but you know, I explain to people that this is going to be painful. This is going to slow down. There are going to be these problems. And sometimes they go great. And sometimes they go, yeah, yeah, of course, John. 
and then off you go and you hit those problems and all of a sudden what's happening why we're slowing down well we said we would you know you might i think you've all probably heard you know it's very difficult to change a tire when you're going down the motorway at 70 miles an hour you need to slow down ideally stop but slow down <laughs> to do it um we all know that but actually then accepting the consequences of doing that is where organizations have problems so it's all about communication if you've got a fantastic team already bought into it then keep them bought in so the communication there is all fe continually feeding that support which would be important but i've never actually had that luxury and i am so challenged if you have got an organization like that it must be well, be great It's hard, yeah. definitely. And it is getting that buy-in. And that's the, the, I'm going to oversell the point, and I think I have been, but it's all about trying to get buy-in from your stakeholders. But no, that's a very good point. And I would have thought with a very large traditional and regulated environment like a bank, it must have been exceptionally difficult to actually get scaled agile in there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, now, this is the one that I didn't do to begin with. Human resources, people, whatever you want to call them. If you do not get them on board, you will struggle massive problems, right? These guys know nothing about Agile. They typically know nothing about software development. They could be working in a software house and they still know nothing about software development. They know about people and processes. And typically command and control and a few things like that and they want to have make sure everyone has their annual appraisal and how do you have an annual appraisal if you've got a group of people working together and not individuals and values are all at group level you have to get them aboard because if you don't um, you will have a queue of people complaining about you to the HR team right if you pre warn them that's gonna happen they, and you give them the ammunition they need to actually defend you, they're very good at defending you. They're lovely people, HR. But if, they, if you haven't told them, and there's a queue of people, that Johnny Letters, he, they all speak in Geordie, by the way, when, they, when they're telling me off. That Johnny Letters, like, you know, um, he's causing all these problems. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's breaking the way we used to do things. It's a problem. Bring him aboard, and it's fine. And don't forget, if you're doing implementing scale agile, you're changing people's roles, you're changing organizational structure, you're changing people's job titles, you're cha changing people's responsibility and accountability. They are all HR features and functions and HR are brilliant at managing those things for you. So get them aboard and get them to do what they're great at and pre-warn them so that it doesn't come as a surprise um, because in my own personal experience, I find whoever complains first, that's the truth. And the fact that if someone goes and, and tells HR, you know, Johnny's making me do some horrible things. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, too late. It's already been seated. So get in there first. Preempt a strike with HR and get them on your side. Um, okay. I think that's all I need to do, cover with HR. The other one, don't forget, unlike Scrum, which you could argue is, is more just the development side, uh, when you're doing scale agile, it's the whole organization. So you've got to wor worry about your IT support, the guys who are putting it in live. Have, you know, it's great if you've got a DevOps team and it's all modern and you've got a wonderful build pipeline and everything's funky dory. If it isn't, and in lots of organizations it isn't like that, to, to do some of these scale agile models, they make some assumptions that you've got this wonderful build pipeline, you've got continuous integration, continuous delivery, and, you know, 
if you haven't got it, you need to look at how you build it. You also need to worry about how you're going to handle support. Who's going to do second line support? Start thinking about these things. You know, you've got scrum teams. Are you going to have separate scrum support teams? Are you going to be bringing tickets into those, into your, uh, in your individual teams? If you're going to do that, it's going to obviously impact the velocity. So you need to think about these things up front. Um, and again, you know, the IT guys are lovely people. Um, for instance, if I had been left to my own devices, that camera wouldn't be working, that wouldn't be working. <laughs> <laughs> the laptop isn't right. So these are very valuable people and they're the ones you need to get again on your side, get them involved in the decision making process. The thing I find useful is sitting down with them and saying, all right, we're going to have this concept and definition of done. What do you care about the software? And all of a sudden they come up with different things than the developers do in the BA. They want to know that it can be installed. They want to know well, what happens if you upgrade someone? Is this database changes? What, what difference does it make? You know, they might even want you to run, produce run books and horrible things like that. But get them involved. And I think the definition of done is quite a good one to get them involved in because it, it means that the teams are developing software that they're happy to accept and run.